Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Judy Smith? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. A recent Patreon pre-release upload was the case of Dallin Millard, an unusual case in Canada that involved a wealthy perpetrator. In the case of Judy Smith, I will first look at the background, move to the timeline of the disappearance, then offer my analysis. Judy Smith was born in Hyannis, Massachusetts on December 15, 1946. She had been married and divorced twice. During her second marriage, she had two children. Sometime around 1986, when Judy was working as a home care nurse, she met a corporate lawyer named Jeffrey Smith. She had been caring for Jeffrey's father after he had throat surgery. Judy and Jeffrey dated for quite some time and married in September 1996. The couple lived in the Boston area. Jeffrey was involved with the medical field through his work as an attorney. He planned on attending the Northeast Pharmaceutical Conference in Philadelphia in 1997. The conference ran from April 9 to 11. Judy was going to travel with him, although she would not attend the conference. After he was done the conference, the couple planned on going to New Jersey to spend some time visiting with friends. The couple arrived at Logan International Airport on April 9 with the intent of boarding a flight to Philadelphia that departed at 1.30 p.m. As they were checking in, Judy realized that she forgot her driver's license. She told Jeffrey to go ahead without her. She would return home, retrieve the license, and then take a later flight. This is what she did. She arrived in Philadelphia at about 7.30 p.m. The two would meet in the lobby of a hotel in Center City, Philadelphia. Judy had flowers and apologized to Jeffrey. The next morning, April 10, Jeffrey left the hotel room to get breakfast. Judy was still asleep in the room. When he returned, he found her in the shower. He mentioned to her that his breakfast was great. She responded, saying that she could go down and eat breakfast in her current condition, like not wearing any clothing. Apparently, this was her attempt at humor. Jeffrey left the room to attend the first session of the day. The plan was for Judy to visit various places in Philadelphia. She was going to function as a tourist. She wanted to see a number of places, including the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall. The couple planned on meeting at 6 p.m. at the conference cocktail party. When Jeffrey was done with the conference that day, he went to the hotel room, but Judy was not there. This was at about 5.30 p.m. He made his way to the party, believing that Judy may have been there, like she misunderstood the instructions. She forgot where they were supposed to meet. After discovering that she was not at the party, he went back and forth between the party and his room a few times, searching for Judy. He then contacted the hotel staff, who called several local hospitals. Jeffrey took a taxi and followed the route of a tour bus that Judy intended on riding that day. He had no success. Sometime around midnight, he called the police and reported his wife missing. The police really didn't take Jeffrey seriously. They told him he would normally have to wait 24 hours to file a report, but despite this rule, he may be able to file the missing person report in the morning. He felt as though the police were dismissive. Jeffrey spoke to the mayor of Philadelphia, Ed Rendell, who just happened to be at the conference. The police decided to become a little bit more responsive after this conversation. The increased concern by the police did not last long. A few months into the investigation, one police officer told Jeffrey that Judy probably had a midlife crisis and was just trying to get attention. The police also started to focus on Jeffrey as a suspect, which he understood, but he wasn't happy about it. The concern the police had in this case was that Judy was an experienced traveler. She had once flown to Thailand on her own. They found it hard to believe that she forgot her driver's license and had to take a separate flight. They thought that Jeffrey was making up this story and that Judy never made it to Philadelphia. Jeffrey murdered her at some point in Massachusetts and was just trying to hide his actions with the story about Judy going missing in Philadelphia. He was really just trying to derail any investigation into where his wife was. A desk clerk at the hotel and one conference attendee both said they saw Judy at the hotel but the police were still skeptical because neither individual had ever met Judy before. 
Perhaps they were mistaken. When the police searched the hotel room, they found that none of Judy's clothes had been worn. They found it strange that she would wear the same clothes on the day she disappeared as she did the day earlier when she flew from Boston to Philadelphia. The police also wondered why Judy did not bring any cosmetics with her. It is believed that Judy had about $200 in cash on her, but there was $500 in cash in the room. Why didn't she take the money? Over the next few days, the media ran stories about Judy's disappearance. A number of witnesses came forward and said that they spotted her. They indicated that she appeared to be suffering from mental health symptoms. One account came from a hotel in Society Hill, which is a historic neighborhood in Center City, Philadelphia. Witnesses described unusual behavior, including Judy spoke in tongues to herself, loudly said that the emperor would wire her money to pay for additional days in the hotel, and masturbated in front of an open window. Another witness spotted Judy at 3 p.m. on the day she disappeared at the intersection of Broad and Locust. She appeared to be disoriented. Additional sightings placed Judy along that tour bus route, the bus that she was supposed to take the day she disappeared. Judy was spotted shopping for dresses at a Macy's store in the Deptford Mall in New Jersey. A salesperson reported that Judy said she was shopping for her daughter, even though her daughter often disliked what Judy would buy for her. Judy's family members said this sounded like Judy, like this is something she would say. The salesperson also noted that Judy was wearing a red backpack and tried to convince another woman to leave with her. Judy had a red backpack, so this report also seemed credible. Despite all these witnesses, months went by and nobody could find Judy Smith. Here we see the case moves to Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina. On September 7, 1997, a father and son were deer hunting, out of season, along a creek about nine miles from Asheville. They encountered the remains of Judy Smith scattered over an area which was 300 feet in diameter. Several of her bones were wrapped in a blanket and buried in a shallow grave near the center of that area. It looked like animals had reached her body and spread the bones around. This area was on a slope that was very difficult to navigate. Dental records were eventually used to make the identification. The cause of death appeared to be stabbing based on injuries to her bones. The leg bones were covered with thermal underwear, jeans, and hiking boots, clothing appropriate for those conditions, like hiking that time of year. There was no sign of the red backpack or any of the clothing Judy was wearing when she was last seen. Judy's wedding ring was found at the scene, although some of her jewelry was missing. An expensive pair of sunglasses was also found there, which family members said did not belong to Judy at the time she disappeared. Winter clothes and $80 in cash were found in a blue backpack. This backpack did not appear to be hers either. A shirt was found buried not far away, which had $87 in the pockets. Again, Judy was thought to have about $200 in her possession when she disappeared. Her wallet was not found near the remains, and her identification was missing as well. Investigators did not understand why Judy was in Asheville, North Carolina. She had never been there before, although she had been to Raleigh, Durham on one prior occasion. There were some witnesses in the Asheville area who remembered seeing Judy in April of 1997, the same month she disappeared from Philadelphia. Witnesses said that she was pleasant and did not appear to be suffering from mental health symptoms. One witness had a revealing conversation with Judy, during which Judy said that her husband was an attorney from Boston. He attended a conference in Philadelphia. As the conference was going on, she decided to take a trip to the Asheville area. Other witnesses spotted Judy driving a gray sedan filled with boxes and bags. Judy asked if she could spend the night at a campground not far from where her body would later be found. She was told no and drove away. The owner of a nearby deli reported that Judy pulled up to her store in a gray sedan, entered, and purchased $30 worth of sandwiches and a toy truck. Investigators tried to figure out what happened, but they did not have enough evidence to form a conclusion. The best guess by the police is that the owner of the sunglasses and the blue backpack is the killer. But that really seems like a reach. 
Are they also going to say that he liked sandwiches and playing with toy trucks? Judy could have interacted with people who did not kill her. It only took one person to commit the homicide. On a trip like that, it makes sense that she would have talked to several people. Now moving to my analysis. Before I look at the theories in this case, I will review some of the unanswered questions. Why did Judy travel to North Carolina? Why was she acting bizarre in the Philadelphia area, but seemed normal in North Carolina? She was seen in a gray sedan. Who owned that vehicle? Where did the vehicle go? If the killer is the one who left behind his sunglasses and backpack, why would he do that? Let's take a look at the theories in this case. Theory number one is that Jeffrey Smith was the killer. He died in 2005 after spending a few years as a potential suspect. The police were suspicious of Jeffrey at first, but later came to believe he was not involved. There were a number of reasons they reached this conclusion. By all accounts, Jeffrey was a loving and caring husband. He had no motive. Jeffrey had an alibi. Several people reported he was at the conference. While he was there, many other witnesses saw Judy in Philadelphia and in New Jersey. Judy acted in a bizarre fashion in those areas. Jeffrey could not have caused that behavior in her. This was something she was choosing to do or part of a mental disorder. In Asheville, North Carolina, Judy interacted with many people. She specifically mentioned that her husband was at a conference in Philadelphia. Another problem with the Jeffrey was the killer theory is the nature of the location where Judy's body was recovered. As I mentioned, it was on a steep slope. The area was difficult to access. The police believed that Judy was murdered at that spot, so the killer did not need to move her body to the area, but even still, Jeffrey could not have reached that location even without dragging or carrying a body because he was morbidly obese. Theory number two, Judy suffered from some type of mental disorder like dissociative amnesia with the dissociative fugue specifier. In other videos, I talked about this disorder in detail, for example, the Hannah Up case. There are four diagnostic criteria for dissociative amnesia, an inability to recall important autobiographical information, the symptoms cause clinically significant distress, the symptoms are not caused through substance use or a neurological condition, and the disturbance cannot be better explained by dissociative identity disorder, PTSD, somatic symptom disorder, or neurocognitive disorder. If a person meets those criteria, they may be diagnosed with dissociative amnesia, but for the dissociative fugue specifier to be assigned, an additional criterion is required, namely, apparently purposeful travel or bewildered wandering. This disorder could explain Judy's behavior, like she started wandering, she didn't remember who she was, somehow she made her way to North Carolina and was murdered randomly, almost certainly based on a sexual motive. Here are the problems with this theory. One, Judy explained to people in North Carolina that she left her husband in Philadelphia. She knew who she was and what she was doing. Two, dissociative amnesia with dissociative fugue is a controversial mental disorder. Many clinicians do not believe it exists. They consider it to be a fantasy. Every single story involving fugue can be explained scientifically. Three, if the fugue does exist, it is exceedingly rare and it is the result of trauma. Judy did not have a trauma history. Moving to theory number three. Judy developed a more scientifically supported and common disorder like bipolar disorder. She entered into a manic phase and left her husband. This explains the suddenness of her decision, not taking the $500 from the hotel room, not using her credit cards, not taking her passport, acting in a bizarre manner, in the Philadelphia area, and engaging in goal-directed behavior, like hiking. While in a manic phase, she stumbled across a killer who took advantage of her vulnerable state. Moving to theory number four, Judy Smith knew exactly what she was doing. She left because she did not want to be with Jeffrey anymore. Perhaps she chose behaviors that would mimic dissociative fugue. She wanted to have some fun, but she wanted to be able to come back someday so she pretended to have dissociative amnesia to leave that door open. This is why she acted in a bizarre fashion in the Philadelphia area. This theory is supported by the missing driver's license event in Boston. 
Maybe there was something back at her house that she forgot, not her driver's license, but something that she wanted to take on her trip away from Jeffrey. Or there was something in her house that she needed that she could not have taken with Jeffrey present, like he would have noticed her packing that item and thought it to be unusual. Just like with theories two and three, her murder was random. She just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. A woman was murdered in that area just two years before Judy was killed. Perhaps that same killer struck again. When considering all these theories, what do I think happened in this case? I think theory number four is the most probable. Judy's actions, including the bizarre behavior, were intentional. She decided that she wanted something different. She knew that leaving Jeffrey on this trip to Philadelphia would create confusion and make it easier to sell the dissociative amnesia story if she wanted to return to her former life. After theory number four, I would go with theory number three, bipolar disorder. I think this is a very close second. Mania or hypomania would explain a lot of behavior in this case. Then I would go with theory number two, dissociative fugue, or maybe she convinced herself that she had dissociative fugue, like self-deception. Finally, I would go with theory number one, Jeffrey was somehow involved. He did have an alibi, however, he could have hired somebody to commit the murder. Moving to my final thoughts. Judy Smith put herself, or found herself, in a vulnerable position. She did not die from exposure, dehydration, or starvation. Rather, she was murdered. This case is a reminder that the world can be a dangerous place to people who are vulnerable. Sadly, there are people out there just waiting for the opportunity to become a killer. Not many, but for any particular victim, it only takes one. Those are my thoughts in the case of Judy Smith. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.